Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever uh, the world finds you today. Um, I am incredibly pleased to open this session uh, with my colleagues to share um, a regional initiative around investing in human resources for health. Um, I want to thank everyone who has taken the time to join us for what is going to be an action-focused session today, we hope, that will draw on our expert panelists on how we can advance an African-led, fit-for-purpose health workforce. Um, I recognize I'm speaking to you as the moderator, as a white North American, but my job is to hopefully ask the questions um, of our colleagues and, and, and funders and folks who need to be in true uh, service and allyship to the African continent in the right way. And, um, but for those of you who don't know me, I am the CEO of Seed Global Health. It's a nonprofit that invests in health system strengthening by training the needed health professionals and workforce and resource limited in our partner countries. Um, I also am a physician by training um, and a healthcare worker myself and the director of the program in global public policy at Harvard Medical School, as well as an IECU and my training is in ICU. Uh, a little bit more about SEED. In the last decade, in partnership with um, our partner countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've trained 40,000 frontline health workers in seven countries, um, really working in service to governments, to ministry priorities, and to health institutions to train doctors, nurses, and midwives that can not only provide direct patient care, but can hopefully help continue the, the training and the partnership from the frontline and the community health workers um, to the facilities as needed. Uh, I'm going to state a fact that everybody knows ingrained already, which is that Africa bears 25% of the world's burden of disease and has only 3% of the world's healthcare workforce. And some of those gains that we have heard that have been made in the global healthcare worker shortages have not been made at the same rate and speed, though, on the African continent. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic certainly worsened workforce challenges around the world and workforce dynamics as attrition, uh, losses of healthcare workers in the global north started to siphon and recruit and sort of and steal a healthcare workforce from some of our partner countries. So we're really at a pivotal moment about how we're going to go forward and change these dynamics. Um, and it is really time for a country led and country owned action, um, which is critical to the recovery, not just for these individual countries, but for our global well being. It's about ensuring coverage for all around this world. It's about being able to deal with not only the health burdens of today, but the growing challenges of tomorrow. It goes without saying, and one of the lessons that I, I certainly hold dear is that um, African leaders and health leaders intimately understand the workforce challenges they face. They live it, they experience it. They know what works and they know what over the long run is actually gonna build a resilient system in their country. So they do not need to be told what to do by partners. They don't need to be told what to do by seed um, or any funders from the global north. What they need is, I would, I would say, um, based on, on what we've heard, is really allyship and a willingness to support our colleagues' priorities and strategic agendas and to mobilize resources, funding, and to support um, the ability to really, to really be able to, to have um, an Africa, you know, to support your initiatives. So our hope is um, that we can break the dynamic where for too long there's not been enough time and enough space to transform healthcare systems and that we can we ensure that health systems are no longer dictated by the whims and interests of the actors that hold the resources. In 2022, Seed Global Health, AMREF Health Africa, and my colleague Desta is here from AMREF, um, and the ministers of health from Malawi, Sierra Leone, Uganda, and Zambia announced at the UN General Assembly, on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, a significant and shared commitment, which is in line with the Africa CDC's new public health order to support a Pan-African-led compact to tackle serious health worker shortages across the continent, and for these four countries to really take the lead in advancing what health workforce investments can look like in a way that transforms health outcomes, is part of economic recovery, and can be the global model for the rest of the world to fall behind and follow. The partners together will develop specific approaches for measuring healthcare worker shortages, 
mapping healthcare worker needs to national disease burdens that are bespoke to the countries, that are led by the priorities of those countries and the health needs of the countries, costing and implementing training and retention plans and measuring those workforce gains in multiple sectors. Partners will work together to mobilize and direct funding towards the established priorities of the countries and the ministries within their national HRH plans and the coalition of public, private sector, and regional leadership to help ensure locally led, globally supported, and integrated approaches to advancing training and retention of the workforce that can further the aims of the WHO roadmap that we've seen, but critically to bring those bespoke country experiences forward. This session um, shares the commitment, uh, will share the, the vision and commitment of the African Union's COVID-19 Commission and the Africa CDC's uh, envision for a fit for purpose health workforce for Africa, which my colleague here will share, that is what we are trying to be in line with. And we will consider how such commitments can help move the needle on health outcomes for long term, uh, for long term gain. So I'm thrilled to introduce briefly our speakers. Their bios are available online, but I'm very honored um, to introduce Dr. Ogo, who is here with us. She's the lead for health financing and investment in the WHO Regional Office for Africa in Brazzaville, Congo. Uh, she's a health economist and a health system specialist with more than 15 years of experience in global health. And in her current role, she leads the work of the WHO Africa region in providing technical expertise to member states, in health financing strategies and reforms, um, as well as health economic analyses and evidence generation. Unfortunately, our colleague from Sierra Leone, Minister Demby, is unable to join us uh, very last minute. He's handling an emergency at home, but he's an epidemiologist and a virologist um, and serves as the Minister of Health and Sanitation and was intended to be the representative from the four countries who are making this commitment. Um, Ms. Desta Laku of AMREF Health Africa leads global partnerships for AMREF. She serves on the executive and senior management team, and she's been instrumental in the establishment and leadership of the first biannual Africa Health Agenda International Conference, or AHEC, which I hope everybody was able to join in March. Um, she's and leading a global South dialogue around knowledge exchange platforms and universal health coverage in Africa and Asia and launching the communities at the heart of the UHC Global Advocacy Campaign. And Dr. Raj Tajuddin is a medical doctor in pediatrics and public health, and he's currently the head of the Public Health Institute and Research at the Africa Center for Disease Control. He coordinates the establishment and strengthening of national public health institutes across the 55 African Union member states, and he coordinates the Africa CDC's health workforce development portfolio. Um, I We're going to have a discussion that is moderated among our panel, but we are going to open this up in a little bit to the audience. So for those of you that are online, um, we very much look forward to your participation and your questions. Um, and certainly to everybody in the room, um, I very much welcome questions. I want to just start as a leading question, and I'm going to ask each of our panelists to comment on this. Um, but you know, a clear focus of this new commitment that we've put forth is to ensure that any efforts are locally led in partnership with governments towards the established health priorities of each country, rather than being dictated by funders or Global North partners around what the targets are, the timeframes. So I'd like to ask you all to explain why this commitment is so important and why really respecting partner countries um, HRH is so important, uh, or the, that their national plans are so important. And what are examples um, to how these partnerships have worked well or not well? So I'm going to actually ask Dr. Taj for you, please, to kick us off. Why do we need to do it this way? No, thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you, um, uh, Vanessa. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I bring you greetings from the African Union and the uh, Africa CDC. Uh, for the sake of people who might not know what um, Africa CDC, what we do, or who we are, Africa CDC is a specialized um, health institution for the African Union, and it is housed within the intergovernmental political um, institution called the African um, Union. So um, <clears throat> in a nutshell, that is what um, Africa CDC um, is all about. Now, 
to your question and uh, why we have to step into the space of um, health and um, workforce um, agenda as um, Africa CDC and uh, as um, Africa um, Union. A couple of um, years ago, I think to be more precise, in 2014, when the Ebola outbreak um, struck in um, West Africa, everything went well, or everything was going well, except the lack of volunteers in the field. And at that time, I mean, uh, Madam Zuma, uh, uh, Delamini Zuma from um, South Africa, was the chairperson of African Union. So she picked up her phone and uh, called all the head of state, one after the other, and said, give me 20 volunteers, 20 volunteers, 20 volunteers. So our plan at that time was to come up with 1,000 volunteers that would go to Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. You know, so fast forward, the Africa CDC agenda was already on the table in 2000, from 2013. So she called on all the ministers of health. This is a time to action the setting up of Africa CDC. So from day one, workforce development has always been on the agenda of Africa CDC. It's been a cross-cutting enabler of what we do as um, Africa CDC. Fast forward, COVID-19 pandemic struck. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we learned so many lessons, but one of the critical lessons we learn as a continent and as Africa CDC is the importance of health workforce. In fact, when the COVID-19 started, there were some member states that didn't even have what it takes to respond. So we have to use the, 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 the military assets at the disposal of the AU um, uh, Peace and Security uh, Council to move volunteers from some member state to other member state because we all know that flights uh, were not moving at that time. So we have to use uh, the military um, assets. Again, further underscoring the importance of um, a workforce. So today we know that if you look at um, food epidemiology training program, we only have um, roughly one third of what is required. If you look at committed workers, we are not uh, far from uh, the same, uh, less than one third of what we need, not to not talk of the clinical care providers. So really going forward, our head of state and government, at that time under the leadership of President Cyril Ramaphosa, really felt the need for us to be able to look at how do we address this workforce gap, among other things, you know, but the attention then was really, really on this earth workforce. And it called for the establishment of earth workforce tax team, you know, really looking at the expertise on the content, to really sit down and look at that space. What do we need to do to move that agenda forward? What do we need to do to, to bridge that gap? What do we need to do to come up with a fit for purpose workforce? What do we need to do to bring the relevant stakeholders, education, health, agriculture, environment, finance, labor and uh, productivity? What do we need to do to bring all of them together so that we can come up with a comprehensive agenda you know, that will get the buy-in of all the key stakeholders so that we can address this um, workforce um, agenda? And to complement that, our head of state and government launched what we call the new public health order that is underpinned by five critical pillars as a way to guarantee the health security sovereignty of our member states and of our region. And that new public health order is underpinned by one very strong institution. And you will agree with me that you can't talk of strong institutions when there are no strong, uh, I mean, um, staff or stronger uh, workforce. Number two is the need to develop and strengthen our workforce capacity on the continent. Number three is to build local manufacturing capacity. Again, it's also underpinned by a very strong workforce. And number four is uh, domestic resource mobilization, meaning that um, this agenda goes beyond just goodwill from the global north. We need to have a way to be able to complement whatever that is coming through goodwill. And in spirit of sustainability, you need to also offer something internally. And uh, President uh, Paul Kagame was actually charged to lead that effort. And last but not the least, which underpin what we are doing here today is that of respected action-oriented partnerships. Partnership that will see our member state priority as the top priority, as 
what should be on the top of the agenda and not the partnership that um, come and uh, dictate or import what has been perceived to work um, somewhere, you know, uh, onto our, our, our continent. So really, this is, um, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what uh, our head of state and government has actually, I mean, uh, challenged us um, to do. And uh, it's also a way to guarantee this air security sovereignty of our member state. And it's also a way to work with all the key stakeholders as far as that workforce development space is concerned to begin to address the need of our member state. So, uh, Vanessa, let me, let, let me stop here and um, back to you. Thank you very much um, for outlining that, Dr. Taj. Desta, I'd love to turn to you because uh, AMRAF has been a real champion of calling for this and, and would love to hear your perspectives and experience. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for having me. And Taj, you know, gave such an amazing background and uh, set the stage very well, I think, for this conversation. Um, you've mentioned the shortfall we'll have of health workers. Uh, by 2030, you you know we understand that health workers are really the foundation of uh, what a health system should be and how a health system operates. Um, so and and uh, Taj has of course very um, very well described how critical a fit for purpose health workforce is, and that uh, the Africa Union agenda and the health strategy. Uh, 2030 also really cements the significance of the health workforce as a core foundation of Africa's ambition to have uh, improved health outcomes and health systems. So we are, you know, very much aligned. And AMREF actually is, for those of you <clears throat> who may not know, AMREF is the largest or the leading health development uh, international NGO that's based, headquartered in Africa. And uh, we run, uh, you know, uh, programming in more than 35 countries. And I think for the last 65 plus years uh, that we have been around here on this continent, uh, we recognize very, very early on that uh, in order to really address the health needs of the continent, we would have to really uh, be much more involved, not just in terms of providing interventions at the community level, but also making sure that we are building the capacity of health systems in the countries in which we operate. So um, we realized very, very early on, uh, you know, in the second decade of our existence that the capacity building and training were really essential for this continent. And so our approach has always been to serve as key partners to ministries of health in the countries in which we operate. And that means really understanding the country's health priorities, uh, so that we can ensure that the key pain points are supported and that all members of the community are really able to access affordable, equitable health services. So uh, we recognize, as I said early, uh, very early on in, in our uh, strategy and interventions, that any strategy or intervention that we are involved in that is owned by the government or the Ministry of Health is far more sustainable and far more impactful. So we operate on that premise that we create intervention, the government has to buy in because really it is the government's agenda at the end of the day. And so uh, why do I say this? I think that the ministries of health, the governments uh, understand what the needs for their country are. And most countries, as mentioned earlier, have, uh, you know, establish systems for looking at their data, perhaps they can, you know, use additional help, but really uh, they have an understanding of what the health needs are, and they are the ones actually best positioned to also prioritize what the health needs are and what the training needs are and what kind of health workforce that they need to, to manage that. So uh, what the pandemic really taught us that, uh, or maybe, accelerated thinking around is really that we really need to urgently target investments to build you know, the right type of sustainable, suitable health workforce that not only ensures that we are prepared for any pandemic uh, or health security issue, but that really focuses on ensuring that we have a functioning fit for purpose health workforce. We also recognize that there was, uh, it was really important to 
uh, for us to collaborate and partner at all levels. So uh, really looking at how can African governments, multilaterals, other partners work together to really make deliberate and sustainable investments to recruit, to train, to compensate, and protect all cadres of health workers. And thus, AMREF has been very much involved uh, with uh, the team at Africa CDC, and certainly we've been very much involved also on the COVID-19 commission that it's being led by uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, we are involved in the task forces also that uh, really focus on health uh, workforce. So what we really work from the standpoint of is that every partner has a voice. So the voice of the government, the voice of the uh, partners on the ground, the voice of our regional bodies have all need to be reflected. And oftentimes, I think when uh, the big challenge is when it comes to HRH or uh, human resource for health is that many global health initiatives and funders have vertical funding initiatives and, and they prioritize you know, their own specific agendas. So what we noticed, uh, Vanessa, is that uh, we recently had the AHEC 2023 this uh, March, uh, very interesting. And we were joined by uh, 12, uh, yeah, 12 African ministers of health. And uh, over the you know, four days of convening, we really understood, it was very, very clear that countries have their priorities. And more often than not, they know exactly what's needed in order to reverse the health status in their countries. They have an understanding of what type of health workforce to prioritize. Um, and we really got excellent feedback uh, on you know, global health initiatives that both reflected their optimism that uh, global health initiatives can really have a significant impact if the country voices are heard. And then also the dismay, I think, that they felt about the challenges that they're experiencing about siloed, you know, donor-driven investments that don't take into consideration the country perspectives. So for us as an organization that has always listened, you know, been at the ground and listening at the intersection between community and government, uh, it was really uh, good to hear that countries also felt uh, similarly that they needed to be held, uh, heard, their voices need to be heard. And so the discussion really that we have at hand is really about power and balance. You know, I think there's general agreement that, uh, you know, global health initiatives can be game changers, but the needs and the priorities of countries differ. And there is a need for the global health initiative to, to be less prescriptive, need to customize funding to country need. We've seen that some of the interventions Taj mentioned earlier require us to really do country by country assessment, even for COVID interventions. You need to do country by country assessment. Every country is different. No country is the same. Um, and what COVID taught us is really, there is a convergence of so many things around pandemic, around health security, around health system infrastructure needs, health workforce needs. So countries typically know they have country work plans and the country perspective and its priorities are important. So any partnership or global health initiative has to put the country priorities at the center of any intervention. And we have seen uh, indeed through our partnership that we've had with Seed Global, that prioritizing the country um, interests is really important because that's when you understand where the gaps are, what needs to be fixed and what needs to be funded. And that's where we look for partners that really look at how do we improve a country's status. So um, quite a bit around, I think, uh, in settings where uh, discussions around, for example, in settings where it is uh, resource, limited resources, uh, how do FGHI or global health initiatives, prescriptive demands really take away or distract from more critical needs? Uh, how do we build efficiencies uh, into interventions and in investments? Um, how do we ensure that even the training, the HRH focus that we have is really outcome or results-based? So I think for, our observation on our end, it's really, we all need to prioritize uh, HRH, 
I think the region has prioritized it, Africa CDC has prioritized it, the AU has prioritized it, ministries have prioritized. And now the biggest issue I think that we need, or the question that we need to tackle is how do we reverse our imbalance on the funding side? How do we ensure that partners and uh, you know, uh, global funders, multinationals are all aligning around the agenda the countries are presenting. And so really, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, that area of power imbalance around funding. Uh, for better I'm going to come back to you on that. Sure. Um, thank you, Des, for that, because I, I actually want to, I do want to come back to that exact question, because I think that is the crux of a lot of this. And you outlined incredibly important points, especially around the silos and the verticalization of diseases and sort of really being able to ensure that the where the needs are outlined, we're actually meeting those needs. Um, I want to ask Dr. Ogo, though, if she could comment on you know, thinking about what we just, how do we best align the World Health Organization and even regional initiatives, um, overarching frameworks that are being generated, you know, the roadmap is being launched uh, to these country-specific efforts. How, how do we ensure that that's happening too? Thank you, Vanessa. And uh, I'll say the good thing about speaking last is you can agree with everyone who spoke before you. Um, and I'm a health economist, not a health workforce specialist, so I also bring a slightly different perspective. Uh, having said that, yes, I mean, uh, I can't speak for WHO globally. I work for the regional office, so I will uh, limit myself to um, what's happening and what we are working with member states on within the region. And uh, specifically, I mean, on your question, I think uh, this morning there was mention about the Workforce Investment Charter, which is what the regional office is working with member states on um, and partners who have been consulted on this as well. And I think it's important to highlight, I mean, there have been frameworks that have been, there have been strategies, but this is named the charter for a very specific reason. It doesn't set out, it doesn't tell people, you know, you must do this or you have to do this or these are your targets. It outlines you know, principles that were agreed amongst all of the stakeholders to, for, to guide investments in the workforce. Um, I think both uh, Taj and Desta have explained very clearly why the workforce is critical for health systems and health systems resilience. And in this, for, in the concept of this, I mean, there are two, these charter starts, you know, with two key principles. There are five. I will mention the first two for now. And one of them is government leadership and stewardship. And that really says whatever is happening, whatever investments need to come in, whatever is being done in a country has to follow what the country determines as its health priorities, what its objectives are, um, and what it wants to achieve. And so, um, and secondly, all looking at evidence-based prioritization and we'll speak to the rest as, uh, you know, with the other questions that come through. But, you know, moving on from just the, the, the charter, I think it's the real focus of this is saying countries should determine. I think Desta explained this very well. Every country is different. Even countries that are next door to each other are slightly different, not just in their health needs, but, you know, health workforce needs are also determined by more than the health, more than the population health needs, but also the health system organization and structure. Uh, a country that's decentralized, the way they organize and, you know, their systems will be different from, you know, one that is more, you know, smaller, more centralized. And so Ghana with its networks of practice uh, or, uh, you know, another country that's focused uh, more on, uh, a district health system approach, the workforce that you need is guided by your model of care together with the population health needs, which then determine how you pull these together. And for some countries, that will mean that they, you know, the skill mix will be different. For others, it means they actually need new care, new types of health workers. If Ghana is going to do, you know, networks of practice, you need more than just doctors, nurses, midwives, or pharmacists or dentists. You need people who can guide people through the networks. And, you know, you know, other countries are starting to think of care navigators and so on. And so it, it's, I think, our position, you know, as others have said clearly is, 
let the country determine what they need to do. They have to prioritize which cadres they need to work in. They have to know what the skill makes they need and partners should support that and partners should align to that and partners should invest on different points along the health workforce production chain, not just in producing. It could be, you know, different things, but as we say, let's uh, not go into much into detail at this point, but happy to speak. Thank you very much. Um, I actually, you know, I, I think that your point about every country needing a different distribution of workforce is right. And there may be different classes of workforce. I think it's interesting because the kinds of workforce we invest in as a global community is also often dictated by the funders. Um, there's been a huge, uh, and I think that, and I, there's, you need all of it in many ways. I mean, I think that there's been a major focus, justly so, on community health workers that are critically needed. We need them in the United States where I'm from. But if we built an entire health system without creating a referral base for community health workers, then we're not actually creating a true fit for purpose workforce. And yet sometimes, so the, and the funding streams can sort of dictate how we, or what's available for us to fund. And so I'd actually like to turn to you, Dr. Taj, about how do we get global health funders and community advocates to recognize that a fit for purpose healthcare workforce is where there are different complements across the workforce. It's not just community health workers, it's not just doctors and, and nurses, but it's it um, there's a whole sort of continuum that includes vaccine manufacturing, epidemiologists, um, that we can really, and sort of why that we we seem to continue to emphasize a priority of a low, we meaning the global funders, will prioritize a model of low cost, easily trained providers often without really thinking through what is the true investment and where's the, the opportunity through the changes and shifts um, that are coming out of the Africa CDC, the African Union COVID-19 Commission, and that you're seeing across countries to start to change that narrative and more importantly, change the funding flows behind a different definition of a fit-for-purpose workforce. No, thank you. Uh, uh Um, our partners are really focusing on the community at workers. You know, even some of our member states are also prioritizing that. In um, 2017, uh, the AU um, summit, I think uh, the one of the key decisions there was to scale up uh, community at workers on the continent. In fact, the target was that um, between that 2017 and 2020, we should produce a uh, Two million community health workers, so that for every six hundred uh, population, you have one community health uh, uh, um, worker. But as you rightly mentioned, uh, with the COVID nineteen pandemic and with the repeated outbreak that we've seen on the continent, I think um, we are having um, a shift um, in that now. People are beginning to understand the importance of um, the other cadres of um, workforce, and uh, this is part of what the COVID nineteen commission was actually set up um, to do to really come up with what sort of cadre, the different cadre that are required, you know, for us to have uh, a fit for purpose um, workforce and um, what will allow us to come out of this COVID-19, uh, what do you call it, a, a pandemic and uh, have in place a resilient and stronger um, air system uh, going forward. And that clearly will require, I mean, at workforce beyond um, just uh, community um, at workers. But whether we like it or not, I think um, we need complementarity of the different um, uh, cadres. And uh, for Africa CDC, we're providing um, support across the entire I mean, uh, spectrum. We have a program that is dedicated to community assistance, supporting the community at workers. We have a program that is dedicated to, I mean, the, the frontline uh, field epidemiology training programs. We have um, a roster of uh, rapid uh, responders with a mixed, um, a mixed uh, sort of um, skill um, set so that um, when there's um, any uh, outbreak or when there's any um, request, we have um, a full team, you know, that can actually be deployed and provide um, the needed uh, uh, support. We have program even up to a level of um, um, leadership you know, to support, I mean, our member state as far as space is uh, concerned. And one of the critical gaps that we've also seen on the continent is lack of leadership, especially within 
the 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 the, the, the global health um, ecosystem as far as the continent is concerned, and um, this is one of the reasons why I mean, when there's an any any uh, outbreak, you discover that the member states or our member states, most of the time, are not in a position or are not strong enough to coordinate who is doing what, where, and how. You know, and this is one of the reasons why uh, part of what I mean the the COVID nineteen commission is looking at is even the leadership within that space. You know, and um, for African Union, the Co the Kofi Annan Global Health Leadership Program is actually uh, meant to actually address that, and it's already doing that. We've rolled out two cohorts already. Uh, the third cohort is about uh, to begin um, very um, soon, but much more importantly, February this year, in presence of our head of state, we did launch our ministerial executive leadership program, mm -hmm. so that they are able to provide that leadership. They're able to provide what it takes to coordinate the different partners, you know, that come um, trying to provide one support or the other as far as um, workforces are, are, are concerned. So really, uh, for African Union, we are not just looking at um, the lowest of the low hanging fruit. We're also looking at the entire global health ecosystem and what sort of cadre of workforce will be required, you know, to guarantee the security sovereignty of our member states. Thank you. Thank you. Because, I, yeah, no, I I, um, I very much appreciate that perspective. And I think it's um, critically important that we realize it's it, it it's the whole spectrum is needed in combination. And I think, you know, my own health system has failed because it is not invested in some of these important uh, cadres. So um, thank you for sharing that perspective. Uh, Desta, I do want to come back to you to that really important point. And I'm going to have you I want you to please elaborate a little bit more on you know, how we have sort of seen the expense, the investments we've made have been in the billions for different diseases and different disease focus. And we've made progress on those diseases, but we've also missed opportunity to be, I think, really transformative um, around health system strengthening. And it's a complex, it is complicated, it requires time, and it takes patience and enduring commitments. And I'd be interested to hear any reflections that you have and experiences you've had on how do we outline the case for that longer term and different kind of investment that is needed? And how do we shake up those power dynamics that, uh, that are being driven in part by the, by the way investments are being made? Uh, thank you, uh, Vanessa. First of all, before I answer that question, I just want to go back and touch on what Taj said. I think Taj raised a very key issue, not only that health workforce, health workers are not the only cadre we're looking at, we're looking at all cadres of health workforce, and that's really important. But moreover, in addition to that, uh, doing leadership management and governance training is critical because you need people at the helm of the health system to ensure that it's functioning appropriately, uh, responsibly, accountably, etc. So, um, what Africa CDC is doing is, is uh, absolutely the right thing. We have been doing it for more than 20 years. We've been running a leadership management and governance training for um, uh, within Africa for more than 20 years. And in fact, uh, that also includes not just training, but mentoring as well. And so I think we need to create uh, maybe communities of practice around how uh, health leadership is seen, how it's practiced, et cetera, across the continent. The other thing that we need to do around that training of health workers is really how do we um, uh, how do we uh, look at our um, uh, curriculum? How do we ensure that we have a curriculum that is uh, uh, reflective of what the region needs and is uh, accepted across countries? Because we do have uh, porous uh, borders, and we want to make sure also that if we align around the curriculum. There's an opportunity for, in, an, in a case such as the, uh, the pandemic, there's an opportunity for uh, health workers of different cadres to move from country to country to provide support. So just want to flag that. And then coming back to um, coming back to the issue of uh, of uh, global health initiatives. Uh, you know, I, I don't think uh, Vanessa. I, I don't think I think that. Uh, multilaterals and global health funders are beginning to see only because we are also beginning to raise our voice to say, you know, uh, there are, is so much needed within country. And when you 
have siloed funding approaches, what you really do is you, in a way, uh, destabilize the health system because you're having them focus on this one thing because this is what the donor wants to focus on. And meanwhile, you have a health system that needs to be strengthened, an entire system that needs to be strengthened, but this donor will only pay for this particular area. And you can't strengthen an entire health system by just focusing on one disease entity. So how do we say, how do we ensure that uh, global health funders and partners are really uh, even working together to say, how can we improve the health system overall and not just focus on one thing? Because when that funder pulls out, you have not strengthened the entire health system. Uh, and so I think that is important, is having increased conversation. There is uh, actually um, uh, a group now, I think Welcome is supporting that on uh, the future of global health systems, because you see on one side, there is Gavi, on one side, there is a global fund, on the next side, there's World Bank. There are so many global funders and, and larger funders also, like some of the big foundations, and they are very focused on what they need to do. And I think that it's our responsibility to really align them and say, as African countries, here are some of the things. When you just fund you know, one siloed approach, then we are not able to strengthen the entire system. And when you leave, that one area is not going to withstand. So we have to do quite a bit of education, quite a bit of, um, you know, involvement of, of funders to say, these are our needs. Each country is different. Uh, every intervention is going to have to be different. Every country has a, a country plan. How do we align around the, what is the basic, what is the common denominator here? The common denominator is really strengthening the health system. So if the common denominator is strengthening the health system, why aren't we focusing on that? Why don't we first strengthen the health system and then say, now we have the cutters, health workers that we need, the, the systems are operating, we've got the labs, we've got all these things, now let's focus one-on-one. -on -one. When you go to do an immunization for a child, why can't you also see the pregnant mother or the mother that needs help? You know, so we need to look at, at solutions that look at community at the center of the intervention. And that's why we engage in global health financing organizations to say, let's put community at the center, which is where we've always uh, tried to operate and build the system, systems around it. That's a conversation. Do you, do, do you think people understand what it means to strengthen a health system? Why don't we take that perspective? Because you and I would sit here and say, that makes so much sense. Yeah. But but why doesn't the, I mean I'm I'm going to totally put you on the spot. Why do you think people even understand what that means to do? Like I mean, these that's funders a good and question. folks. <clears throat> that's a good question. And, and I would no. ask all the panelists to chime in on this one. Yeah. But Desta, please. Uh, you know, my view is that uh funders have a priority, an interest, right? So you have an interest, you're funding that interest. Does that interest include strengthening the health system or include understanding the problem from the perspective of a community? No, it really doesn't, because how can you understand the context of the country you're funding? Most of these global health initiatives are not, all of them are not based here. They cannot possibly understand the reality of community health. They cannot possibly understand the reality of uh, the health system, uh, whether it's broken or whether it needs to be fixed. Do they really understand the extent? And, and my view is uh, probably not as well as they could. And probably they don't understand the impact of having siloed funding approach, uh, the dependency that's caused, the lack of strengthening of all the other areas, whether it is the health leadership, whether it is, uh, you know, the system itself, uh, you know, I don't think they, I don't think there's that perspective uh, and not for bad reasons, but simply because they don't understand, they don't operate from there. Um, and, and you, Vanessa, I mean, you're sitting in the US, you understand it's a different health system, uh, but here in Africa, really we have to focus on community because that's, that's we, we develop our intervention with the community at the heart of what we do. And I don't think funders develop their funding opportunities with the community at the heart of their, uh, what they do. And if they did, then they would say, we need to actually first fix the health system. We need to strengthen that health system. We need to make sure there's health workforce there already. And then when we have that 
we can then uh, that might then because for the record I, I is not going to uh, support <laughs> For the record, I think the U.S. also needs a very community-based healthcare system. We have an epidemic of women dying in childbirth right now because we are not focused on the communities and what those needs are. So um, there are certainly differences, but I don't think we've nailed it at all. So I, I would agree with that. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Ogo, I'm going to throw a tough one to you too, because along these lines of health systems, we do invest in healthcare workforce and training. And then we find that we need to figure out that there's challenges to producing them, but when they're produced, then we have to retain them. We have to protect them. We want to absorb them. And sometimes there's funding to do the training part, but there's not the fiscal space then to be able to retain um, or to, to, to fully, uh, you know, to produce in, in for the right, for the right health needs. So, um, you know, I, I was going to ask Mr. Demby this, but I'm going to put you on the, on the spot to, from your experience and, and your health economy experience that there's obviously supply problems, there's shortages in doctors, nurses, community health workers, epidemiologists, um, radiologists, you know, laboratory, uh, but where a country can potentially produce enough graduates, for example, they might not be able to retain them. We're in a climate right now where there's global retention, I mean, global recruitment happening to pull folks um, away from countries. And so this is a huge challenge. And I welcome your thoughts on how we can effectively tackle this complexity and where there might be examples of countries that have, have done this and how the global community and, and our partners in Africa, how, how folks can help maybe change this dynamic. Thanks, Vanessa, for the tough question. Uh, <laughs> before I jump into that, actually, uh, on the prior that you had asked, you know, um, Dester, uh, just, I think, important to uh, make one point as well. And again, I'm, a, I'm an economist. We think uh, in terms of incentives a lot. And so um, I believe that quite a few of external donors and partners probably have a better understanding of how systems and what it takes to build one than we give them credit for. The issue is their incentives are not driving them to do that, right? So if I'm funded to, if I'm set up to support uh, addressing HIV epidemic, that is my incentive. All of my effort is going into that because that's what I'm measured by. And that's how I demonstrate progress. And I will only change that track if the incentives change. And it's not happening as much on the African continent, but bringing the perspective of having worked in Asia for a while, you see that that change is starting to come because you're suddenly finding that progress is stalled. And progress is stalled because you've reached the limit of what you can do with the parallel system. If you don't put more to strengthen the system, get more health workers, build out the service delivery system, then it doesn't matter what you do. You're not going to get more children immunized. You're not going to get more people treated with TB. And so at that point, or at the point where countries are experiencing economic growth and it's time to leave, and then you find actually everything I've spent the past 10, 15 years building in this country is about to fall apart. Mm. And those are the things that, are, that, those are the incentives that are starting to change the minds of partners slowly. And so it's just to say, it's all about incentives and we have to find a way to change the incentives for global partners to strengthen the system. Coming back to your question, uh, Yes, definitely. I mean, I think anyone who sat through uh, the session yesterday, for instance, on uh, health migration, um, we heard some really strong examples from countries about how they're invested in producing, but have, you know, a lack in the fiscal space to either recruit uh, or retain and as a result are losing health workers and I think uh, it was uh, also expressed that even though there is a shortage in Africa, but there is also um, underemployment 
and unemployment amongst the workforce, which in itself is, is a real paradox. Uh, not an easy thing to, to address. Uh, I will speak uh, slightly to, you know, two examples that have been work, you know, working. Uh, one, but, uh, as a result of the health labor market analysis, I think uh, Zimbabwe spoke this morning, and we know this is a country that as a result of, you know, understanding how they were losing health workers, triggered additional investment, not just from the government, but unlocked from external partners like the Global Fund as well, to support retention schemes for health workers. Now, um, the other, actually, one other country that has inspired um, the work around the investment charter has been Niger, and I believe the Niger Minister of Labor is, is here this week. And this is a country where they've had ministers, Minister of Labor, Minister of, of Economy and Planning and Health, you know, together working, they've developed uh, their roadmap, their plan, investment plan, covering more than just one sector. It's really a rural development um, uh, workforce scheme. And we're able to raise funds through an investment forum in, uh, in Paris to support this to the tune of, you know, um, I think almost uh, some billions of dollars. But this is a case where, where there is, you know, commitment from a country and not just, you know, one side trying to say lots of things or a health minister going by himself and carrying a placard for more health workers, but going together with other ministers, they're able to make the case, this is what we need, this is what we're planning to do, and having a credible plan as well. I mean, I think it's important to highlight that attracting investment beyond you know, I'm going to train 200 health workers this week, or I'm going to do ad hoc in-service training to attract the sort of long-term investment across the entire, uh, you know, value chain for the health workforce means that you have to be able to demonstrate to external partners that you are clear what you want to achieve, how you will achieve it, what the results will be, and what the accountability structures will be for that. And being able to say, I want, these are the issues, we are losing people, so we want to train people in place, and this is how we're going to do it, this is how we hope to retain them, you are more likely to get someone saying, okay, I believe in this plan, than if you're not as clear, if you just have, you know, a long wish list. We would like to retain more health workers, but you're not sure how, or you don't have a clear strategy for what it is that drives, um, to address the key drivers of, you know, attrition or, or out-migration for the health workforce. So certainly not an easy uh, issue to address, but I think that, um, you know, it still comes down to even where countries need external support, there's got to be that clarity and that leadership from the national government to be able to attract the investments that are needed um, in a sustainable way. Thank you very much for that question. Um, we are going to, I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll move to questions from the audience in the room. Um, this is actually for um, all three of you kindly to, to answer. Um, you know, I think that one of the struggles that often happens, I think, in this case is that people don't understand, still maybe don't understand our global connectivity in this moment and how um, sort of really, so I guess the question is how do we get everyone to recognize that our collective effort should be to demand a, a larger part of the pie rather than continuing to fight over limited resources? How do we mobilize more money for health, more money for health system strengthening and create that collaborative and collective action that actually could be truly transformative? And I, you know, it's, one of the things that is very much in my mind as we look at climate change is that, that the fight to combat climate change is a completely global issue. It affects all of us. We were, none of us are insulated from it. And, and the climate affects human health very much as well. And so how do we, but how do we create that kind of collective action and sense of coalition around mm. these initiatives and especially making the investments and mobilizing more of the pie to be available rather than fighting over pieces of the pie? Taj, do you want to take a stab first? So, you know, solve the big problems. 
I thought, I thought you were going to ask the health economics to to take the lead on this. I'm going to, but I'm going to go to you first. <laughs> no, 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 thank you, thank you. So I'll go again, to her next. Uh, let me take us back to the Abuja declaration. You know, this issue of 15 percent. Some of us have been hearing it since we were medical students. That 15 percent of the national budget should go into health, but up to today, on the continent of Africa, less than three. Uh, maybe three or four countries are the, the, the countries that have been able to reach that target. So the big question is, is there something wrong with that target? What went into that decision of that 15 15? Because if we have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if um, over these years we've been going round and round and round despite all the advocacy, no country has been, I mean, very few countries have been able to reach that. Is the issue of misplaced priority? So I think uh, we might need to revisit that um, so-called uh, 15%. So that's number one for me. Uh, number two, in terms of um, going forward, what do we need to do? I think we need a lot of advocacy. We need a lot of advocacy. And uh, we also need to get our framing right. Uh, because if I remember very well, uh, before now, most of the time when we make a case for investment or financing uh, uh, for health, uh, many at times we tend to focus more on mortality rather than framing it around social economic development, rather than making the case that, look, any health issue is a social issue, is an economic issue, is a security issue. You know, until we get our framing right, we'll continue to find it difficult to really, you know, get, I mean, uh, uh, adequate um, resources allocated to uh, to health. Number three, I, I think, um, uh, with all your apologies, our ministers of health also need to do more. You know, I'm not sure in terms of um, the politics, uh, because uh, I try to look around. I, I'm from Nigeria. If you pick President Buhari today, and the next uh, minister is possibly the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the next one is possibly the foreign, I mean, the the defense, the next one is possibly the finance. So the, the ministers of health is uh, down the, the, the ladder. So when it comes to allocation of resources, the same thing also happened. I was in South Sudan. I really put those parliamentarians on the spot. What exactly is happening to allocation? And uh, they were really able to open up, you know, to say that, look, uh, in terms of uh, hierarchy, when these decisions are made, the ministers of uh, health, they are done the, the, the letter. So again, I, I think we need to really, I mean, uh, find a way to get our framing right. We need to find a way to also get our politics right. And uh, from Africa CDC, a lot of advocacy has actually gone into that. A lot of advocacy. And number four for me is um, to also begin to move away from our um, uh, traditional funders. I don't like using the word donors. So our traditional funders, you know, to those, I mean, uh, the, the private sector, what exactly is um, within that space that can be tapped into, you know, especially now that we're beginning to look at framing health issue from socioeconomic perspective. So the private sector need to uh, come on board. Our philanthropists, we need to find a way to begin to tap into what I mean, um, these uh, uh, guys are doing and see how do we mobilize uh, more resources. The hospitality sector, you know, we need to go into that space, you know, tap, I mean, and, and get um, uh, more, more, more resources from all those uh, uh, places. So, really, there's no one size fits all. I think um, we just need to continue to look at, um, I mean, health around, uh, I mean, the framing around social economic uh, 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 development. And uh, by so doing, we hope that um, we we'll get uh, what it takes, you know, to drive the health um, agenda forward. Over. Thank you very much for those thoughts. Dr. Ogo. Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, well, I mean, if we are, are we demanding a larger pie nationally or regionally, that's um, it's all relative. But um, as I've mentioned before, one uh, incentives matter, of course. I think Taj alluded to to some of these earlier. Of course, when we speak generally about advocating for more resources for health. Um, there are different, you know, um, aspects to that. And on the one hand, while we recognize the difficulties faced uh, politically uh, by ministers of health and 
uh, as you know, and pri how many countries deprioritize health. And we've said for a long time that, you know, framing this as a socioeconomic thing would change minds. And I would have thought that the pandemic would have convinced everyone that actually when things go wrong in health, they go wrong everywhere else. But clearly um, it's, we have fairly, uh, we have amnesia uh nationally regionally globally and so uh the reminders need to keep going um so on the one hand there is of course the need to continue to um advocate and make efforts towards more resources domestically in the current climate of course we understand that's difficult for many countries in our region that's uh, you know facing real fiscal constraints and so um it's also harder to keep advocating when we are not spending well enough so it's got to be two things right we are advocating for more resources but we're also demonstrating how we can use resources even better to get uh, more results, better results, better health outcomes for people. The challenge, uh, we recognize the potential the private sector holds um, in supporting, you know, fiscal space expansion. The challenge has always been that on our continent, it's not easy to have the strong oversight from governments to be able to really ensure that resources from the private sector, investments from the private sector are geared and targeted towards public policy objectives. And I think that that is something that still needs to be addressed. And so um, continuing work on, you know, building that leadership and uh, stewardship capacity to ensure that when resources are mobilized from different places, whether from traditional or non-traditional donors, uh, from private or other public entities, that there is the capacity to ensure that they work together, that these resources can work together in a coordinated way in support of, you know, the country's one plan, one strategy, and one measurement framework. Over. Um, that is uh, really terrific points. Um, and I very much appreciate the, the perspective about needing to demonstrate also the ability to to absorb, to spend, to help drive some of that. Um, Desta, I'd love your uh, thoughts too on how we can increase. If you sure, um, well, I am not an economist either, uh, but uh, <laughs> my perspective is, um, I think, uh, on the issue of, for example, the Apuja Declaration. I think it doesn't mean as countries get richer that their health spending increases or their investment in health increases. So it's not, uh, you know, uh, not surprising, I think, uh, that we're not seeing the level of commitment that was made in Abuja taking place. My view actually is that one of the big challenges is that um, development assistance to a large degree is probably crowding out uh, the opportunity for uh, countries to really build their domestic financing capabilities. Um, and therefore, you have uh, little investment or not sufficient investments uh, that the countries are making themselves. And let me just say, with respect to, for example, health workforce, you have many development agencies or funders who come in. Uh, a very obvious one, for example, is PEPFAR, train community health workers. Um, and then, you know, you put them in a, in, a, in a price point or a category that the country cannot absorb them. So it's really understanding what is the local context and what can the government really absorb once these uh, health workers are trained. So, that, you know, working together. And I say things so to some degree, uh, the funders or the global health initiatives uh, of different kinds have to really um, work with countries so that countries can also build their domestic financing schemes, whatever those are, whether they're, you know, national health insurance platforms or tax-based financing, whatever those financing mechanisms are. Um, so I think that's one issue. 
And the other issue is, I think, to some large degree, we also need to have some political will um, to ensure that the environment is friendly for those who can actually help us to finance our health system. For example, the private sector, do we have the right regulatory uh, infrastructure that will allow private sector to invest in, in health, uh, delivering health or, or providing those kind of services in Africa. So I think between, um, between um, political will in country, between the, it's just, a, we're just at a space where everything meets and not necessarily fits in well. So development assistance, what the impact of it, uh, in terms of us investing in our own national uh, health systems. Um, how do we uh, gain the political will and traction that we need to invest more in health and more in training? Um, how do we create um, fiscal space so that the cadres of health workers that we train are not leaving us and uh, uh, we're experiencing the effects of migration because we don't, we're not hiring or retaining them or absorbing them into our system. So I think there are many things at play here and uh, not necessarily one solid answer, but I would just say, you know, some of it is around the financing of healthcare on this continent. Um, you know, loans, debt, uh, those kind of things. <laughs> Thank you. And I appreciate that all three of you touched on very different approaches to that question, um, which is a thorny one, especially at a time where, you know, the Oxfam just came out with a report that two thirds of the world's wealth was basically accumulated by something like 22 people over the last year or over the course of COVID. So um, I, I think that how we mobilize resources is critically important from all of these different perspectives and what the incentives can be and how, and how we can create it and build the capacity. Um, I want to turn, I will turn to the chat. That's a more structured place for me to see some of the questions come in, but I'd like to turn to the room and see if folks have any questions for um, the panelists today. Yeah, I'm gonna, I can't see names, so I'm gonna ask the gentleman in front and then I'll go to you in back and then I'll go to the chat. Please introduce yourself. Oh, and there's one over here. Oh, there's lots of questions. Okay, <laughs> I love this, this is good. Um, so then why don't I ask please for the two gentlemen here to both ask your questions right after the other. Please introduce yourself and where you're from. I'll have the panelists answer and then I will come to this side of the room and then we will aim to get to the chat too. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vanessa and uh, panelists for doing a very good job to this discussion. My name is Dr. James Avoka Samani. I am a health economist and a health system scientist. I work with the WHO Africa region as a team lead for health workforce. I, this topic is something that is very passionate for me because this is the area that I make my living and this is the area that I, <laughs> yeah, the first thing. Uh, we need you on here, Dennis, you a panel away. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ogo mentioned the key word, incentive. So that's where I make my living, that's the incentive. But more importantly, that is where I contribute to the developing Africa. Now, the, I have one comment and one question. The comment I have is this, Africa's workforce challenges need to be addressed contextually. And everybody here agrees with that and everybody has raised that point. That means that the evidence needs to be generated contextually. It needs to be led by governments, including everybody, every stakeholder in that country to prioritize contextually and to raise the resources to invest in it. One thing so far I'm seeing a discussion is that it appears that we are turning the focus more on funders and external donors, which in fact is a very small contribution, very insignificant in the address of the workforce crisis. The workforce crisis, at the moment we have um, only 4% of official development assistance going to health workforce, and 44 to 55% of that 4% is for in-service training, training the same health worker for disease interventions, taking that worker from work and keeping them on training in service training ground, instead of employing more of the unemployed to, be, to add more hands to work, instead of putting the money in training more health workers to come and add more hands. So in fact, that money is really not helping out the crisis. What is to address the crisis is domestic resources to invest strategically in training more health workers to fill up the gaps and 
employing them to make sure they are used, and ensuring they are retained so that we don't lose them to high-income countries as we are doing now. So what I'm saying is this. What is going to be new with this discussion we are having now to enable countries to be able to invest more in health workers using predominantly domestic resources, which we already agree is difficult to come by. Countries are not meeting Abuja target. Of course, Abuja target comes with its own problems, but at least enough investments are not going in there. What can we do together to get countries to be energized, to stimulate new investments and unlock hidden investments to go in there? The evidence is clear. Workforce is, is the, the, the least, when budgets are allocated to health sector, workforce is the least part that is bent. And in Africa, we've seen it. Many budget upon budget, year after year, the budget for recruitment, at the end of the year, 60% of that funds is not used, and the new budget comes. How can we unlock that? It, and how can we demonstrate efficiency when, we, when the funds are unlocked for us to be able to use it? Because workforce is a, a big part of the one out of four dollars that we lost to inefficiency in Africa, in health in Africa. So the question I have is, what can we do differently? Thank you. And by the way, just to invite you, I think we need to work in more together. CID Global, Africa CDC, and all the partners, I think we should work more together. I just want to start by saying I love that idea. I think that the more of us solving this problem, thinking the voices, AMREF, all of us together, we can start to champion some of these changes. I think the question is terrific, and I'm very appreciative of it. And I'm going to turn to our panelists who would like to take a stab. Let me go. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, um, I, I will. So we are going to take the second question. My fault. We'll take a second question. Then we will address this question. And then I will go to the chat and then I'll go to the room. I changed my mind. Go. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. And I fully agree with James on um, domestic resourcing. So my, my quick question, I wanted to ask a question to Taj. Because, um, and it regards the, um, the global health initiatives that are disrupting and that are contributing to strengthening our systems. And of course, focusing on PSC. And I'm asking myself, are we accomplices? Are we partners in crime? What should we do so that, um, as they say, the, the measure of true empowerment is the power to say no? What should we do at national level to say no to some of these mechanisms? What should we do at continental level to say no to these mechanisms that are not assisting us to strengthen our systems? that are not assisting us to invest where it matters most at the PSC, so that we have a solid no that is actually, that actually translates to better investment of the global mechanisms that we have in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. And do you mind just sharing your, your name and affiliation for the group? I'm avoiding that because my name is George. I'm from Amref. <laughs> I know George, but that's why I wanted to, because it's a very good question. So George, I wanted you to have credit. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, but I think these are both fantastic questions. And Taj, you get them both to start. Okay. Good. So let me start with um, uh, George. So um, if you look at the continent, uh, most of the time our member states do not have what it takes to say no to some of these issues. You know, and uh, this is partly what informed the ministerial executive leadership program that uh, we launched as Africa CDC February this year. You know, part of what we intend to do is to be able to empower our ministers to be able to know how to engage our partners strategically. That is not to say there were no existing programs before now. We are aware of what um, Harvard School of Public Health and the Kennedy School have been doing you know, before now, but uh, again, whose agenda has been driven, you know, whether the local context has been factored into that program, we don't know. And uh, whether people are actually going there for tourism or not, we don't know. But again, uh, we've launched our own and um, the the major, I mean, um, reason behind that is to be able to empower them. Now, if you look at some of the countries that have been able to say no, you know, and I'll give you two examples. Ethiopia is one, Rwanda is two. When you go there, when you come as partner, you will do what the government wants and not what you want. You know, in fact, Ethiopia is one of the few countries that started the idea of one country, one plan, one monitoring mechanism. 
you know, and I've been able to get it right. And uh, living witness is Dr. Tedros. You know, when you go to Rwanda, it's also like that. The example is there for us, I mean, A to C. So I think um, going forward, we just need to continue to find a way to build the capacity of our member states to be able to provide that leadership, that coordination, you know, to be able to really know what exactly is in the interest of their populace and not what's in the interest of the partners. Number two, we have a lot of partners around the table here. There is no proper coordination. There is no collaboration. There is no communication. There is no cooperation. So these forces, we need to find a way, you know, to make sure that even partners among ourselves, we need to get it right so that we avoid unnecessary duplication of effort, some of which are really, really counterproductive. I think we need to get um, that um, uh, uh, right. Now, on the issue of um, um, the, the, the what, what is it that we need to do um, uh, differently this time around, from, yeah, whatever. One, we need to look at the Abuja declaration because if you look at that 15%, there's so many theories behind that 15%. You know, where some even said it was not informed by any evidence. You know, again, Professor Moswa, you are here, so please, maybe you need, you shed more light on that. You know, so we need to revisit that. I think I think that, that that's, that's number one, you know. Then number two, uh, this time around, the... The, the agenda has gone beyond just the Ministry of Health. You know, we have all realized that we need to bring all the other key sectors on board. In fact, with the COVID-19 pandemic, for the first time in a long time, health issues has gone to the head of state level. As Africa CDC, we were able to talk to head of state more than 17 times in the space of two years for this COVID-19 pandemic, not just one, the Bureau talking of 13 of them, you know? So uh, this is an opportunity for us to get it right. You know, so if you don't push the agenda now, I don't know when we are going to push it. So that is um, uh, uh, number two. Number three for me is uh, for the first time again, you know, the, 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 what they call it, the global community. You know, I've also realized that we need to invest in health. You know, and uh, there is no health without workforce. Thank you. Thank you for those two questions. And I would add to specific to the commitment that was made in September. The hope is to be able to really work aligned with the governments in partnership with them to the point of helping to build what that space looks like and make that transition um, to create a model that can be replicable, but to think about those exact questions. And I think both of those questions were spot on. Um, I do want to turn to the chat and, and ask one of the, the questions that came in, and then we'll return to the room. Um, there, there was a question from uh, Kate Telenko, who has actually um, a, a couple questions. Uh, the one that I'd love to ask is um, sort of how do we, well, they're both good questions, but they're very different. So I'll stick with this one. Um, you know, Often there's a funders will and partners might motivate around the quick fixes, right? The short term, the things that are low lying fruit, they come in for two day trainings or they'll do a cadre that can be trained very quickly. Um, but how do we persuade donors to invest in trainings with longer time horizons like nurses for four years or physicians that might take six years? Um, but these multi-year programs, because it, it, there needs to be a pipeline that is sustained over time and then to, and to look that through. So how do we, uh, how are we going to persuade, I know you don't like the word donors, I actually don't either, but I'm reading the question. How do we convince funders and partners to support these longer term initiatives and to, and to really see them through? And I'm going to, do you want, who wants to take this of, of, my, of our panelists, our esteemed panelists? Um, no one's raising hand. So Dr. Ogo, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> Oh, Desta, are you ready? <laughs> you're going to call well, on me then. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're never ready for the question that comes next. But I will say this. I think that um, when partners are engaged and there is sort of a co-creation uh, around the funding that they uh, have available to give, then these kind of discussions happen. Many times, uh, if a funder or if a partner understands how critical it is, what does this investment today mean over X number of years? 
for this country. And I think it's really being able to bring partners on board and have continuous dialogue, open and continuous dialogue. Here's what we need. We have a nursing shortage. This is how many years it takes to train a nurse from day one to entry and absorption into the health system. Uh, this is the kind of, I don't think that we are necessarily approaching or positioning the issue in a way that partners uh, recognize and understand the impact that they can make with a longer term investment on a health cutter, for example. So I would say we have joint responsibility, funders also to understand what the implications are of funding something. And we also have a responsibility to be very clear and say, this multi-year engagement will result in X. And then ensure that that training of that cadre of health worker is not uh, so that we can they can migrate somewhere, but that there is an absorption capacity within the health system in that country. So I think really being able to map that out would be important for a partner uh, if their priority is to support and build the health system in a country. Thank you. Um, I, I may, I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Wong, because you have any questions, or we can ask another question if you want to make a comment. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, not, I mean, not a complicated one. It's, um, and I agree with the question anyway, in some ways. I think someone once said, um, you know, if Global Fund had started investing in how training institutions when they first started. By now, they would have had, you know, several years of health workers produced from those institutions. But uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, they say. But um, uh, I think I also link this a bit, you know, back to James's um, comment and question, which is one, having the, we know today, that a lot of uh, external funds has not supported health workforce development. And that's because it's gone into the quick fixes. Again, as I mentioned before, incentives. People think if I train someone for two weeks, they can deliver the services I want and I get more people put on ARVs or more people covered with dots and whatnot. But the truth is at a point, you run out of people to train and then you're training people, you know, three, four months out of the year and they're not actually delivering. So they're no longer giving out the ARVs or the dots and everything kind of starts to fall apart at that point in time. And so on the one hand, uh, public governments have to have the evidence want to say, this is the workforce we have. If you want to achieve this result, you're not going to get there without putting more to recruit more, right? But those conversations don't happen. And I ask the question often, you know, who is the government? The government is a bunch of different people, again, all of whom have different incentives. So maybe the director of planning would have this data and really want to engage with external partners on this conversation, but the HIV program manager does not. They want to get the funding so they can control it. And so the two examples Taj gave, there are two countries where in a way they've solved one, the coordination issue in their governments. So when you say the government, you know who the government is. Mm. In many countries, we don't know. Like the government depends on who you're talking to today, right? And tomorrow it could be another face of the government who thinks something else entirely. And so that until that is solved fundamentally in many countries, we are not going to resolve this. But also that getting more public resources, and I think it does require working multisectorally. And I say this because one, if you have funding to recruit, even in the budget, to recruit 5,000 health workers, a country I know well, I say we're going to recruit 5,000 health workers this year. But you know what? It takes them two years to even recruit one health worker. Then at the end of the year, you're going to return the money to Treasury. No recruitment because your processes are in trouble. And part of it is because they're still stuck with a civil service. Sometimes it takes bold action to say, maybe we need to find other ways to recruit health workers. How can we fast track it? How can we improve how we spend? And when you can do that successfully, it's a lot easier to advocate for more, either from the public purse 
or to convince donors that if they give you money for three years, you will actually recruit health workers who will work for two and a half of those three years, rather than people who will, by the time you recruit them, you know, the funding cycle is over. So I'll stop. Thank you. Um, I'm this aware we're coming to that I want to add to her what she just said. I think the whole issue around evidence generation is critical. And many times we're not funded for, uh, you know, uh, evidence generation that can actually prove uh, to a funder uh, in order for them to also enable them to do decision making. So there is a need for funding around data and evidence generation so that people can have, uh, uh, you know, a, a good mechanism which to make decisions. Thank you. Um, we are coming to the end of time. And so uh, not for good, but for our panel. Uh, I know there are a few questions on this side. We're all waking up, right? <laughs> As we get, come to the end of the day. Are there I, questions been answered? Are there remaining questions on this side that would like to be asked? Or I can ask for conclusions. Professor Maswa, you had one. You do. So I'm going to ask you each to ask your questions very quickly, and we will endeavor to answer them all as quickly as we can. Uh, uh, very briefly, first, uh, Abuja, 15%. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> I was a so member <laughs> of the 15-person drafting committee. <gasps> and I did not support 15%. It came from a colleague from Cameroon, and she said, this is what happens in the European Union. Oh. Therefore, let's also do it in the African Union. And I was uh, arguing for uh, uh, Brundtland, Dr. Brundtland had appointed a, 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 a SACS committee, commission, which had recommended $45 per capita. So I was pushing for the per capita. But uh, that colleague, she spoke English, she spoke French, and she... <laughs> <laughs> and, and she carried the day. But let's go back, let's leave it, because ministers of health and finance say agriculture wants 20%, health wants 15%, another group wants total 150%. So I would like to argue, to continue to argue, for a per capita. And WHO figure today, I think, is it 86 per capita. And we will be able to get countries, if we show them you are spending only three, five, and so on, to do more than if. So forget Abuja, I don't advocate for it. <laughs> then, that is a brilliant story, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> then this whole issue of um, uh, leadership governance. These things are written up. The WHO at one time uh, advocated for what is called swaps, sector-wide approaches. If you implement that, you achieve what Rwanda is doing, what Dr. Tedros was doing. There was a time in Uganda when we also did it, country-led, one plan, one implementation mechanism, one monitoring mechanism. Those who don't follow it, you show them the way to the airport. And it works. And when it works well, they will all come. They all come because they want results to take back home. And I have written this argument down, this position down, in a book called African Health Leaders, Making Change and Claiming the Future. Oxford University Press, together with Lord Chris. How many of you have heard of that book? This story is there. Please buy it, read it, and you'll find the answers there. Then lastly, let's work together like we are being called upon here. I'm so delighted to see WHO sitting with you people from the African CDC. But there are other partners whom we need to bring in civil society groups, professional associations. When we have our uh, work, meetings, or whatever consultations, let's bring all those. HRH has got an old uh, um, uh, CSO, African Platform on Human Resources for Health, established in 2005. It was headquartered at Afro at one time, then it moved to NEPAD, 
And uh, right now it is with my organization in Kampala and the chair is from Ghana, Dr. Dev Dovlo, whom you all know. So let's go together. Let's go together and we will get there. And ministers change, technical people in the ministries change. So we must never get tired of building their capacity. And then, uh, you know, even you are now doing a minister's uh, leadership, executive leadership. But we've done this. Our colleague there, uh, Joshua from EXA, we have written a handbook for health ministers with ministers. But you don't know about it. It is there. Why don't you know about it? <laughs> Thank you. These are excellent points. Thank you, Kasum. Thank you, Hasum Jalo from the Health Workforce Department here in headquarters. Uh, I just wanted to build on two or three points that I think are fundamental. We have two problems. We have a problem of flag and we have a problem of compartmentalization. Today, Raj, you came here to talk about Africa CDC. Ugo is talking about WHO Afro. Desta is talking about AMREF. Who is talking about Africa? Everyone is raising flags, saying this is my organization, this is what we want to do. And this is the approach that we are adopting when we are going for resource mobilization. We are mobilizing resources for Africa on behalf of Africa, but for our organization. And I think we have to change this. I've been in this field now for quite some time, not as long as my professor here. <laughs> <laughs> but I was here in 2002. Until 2005, I left for 12 years. I came back, 90% of the problem were the same. So again, let's think together. Let's conceptualize. We are talking about multi-sectoral approach. We are talking about one plan, one thing, and that. But in the actions, we are not doing it. Whenever we talk about it, tomorrow we come and we start again. Okay, we WC we want to do this. We we Africa CDC want to do this. We AMREF want to do this. We another organization want to do this. What about having a cross organization? think for Africa and saying, okay, this is a big challenge for Africa. How do we come together in one plan, one implementation, one everything you want, but one? African plan. I think that would be something that would help a lot because we know the problems, we, but we are not solution oriented. Or even if we are thinking about solution, we are thinking just like this. We have to start thinking like this. Thank you. Thank you. And I love that challenge. And I think for the record, I am I want to say that I'm incredibly proud to be partnered with AMREF and with four countries with the desire for more countries to join this commitment to try to create a holistic and unified voice. There were four ministers of health that stood on stage in New York with AMREF, with SEED, um, and, and your colleague from the Africa CDC joined also to represent the fact that we were trying to align towards this pan-African vision, because that is the goal. I think ultimately is to change that conversation, but I want to very much appreciate your points about the actions need to continue to harmonize and to move forward. And I remain incredibly hopeful that we can tighten our links with the Africa CDC, with the Africa WHO and to find a way. And I, you know, for me, it was a great honor to have Africa CDC and WHO at the table. My colleague Desta, we'd wanted the minister from Sierra Leone to represent the countries and the effort we're making, but this is not closed. This is intended to be a movement that we can all start to change a conversation for you know, frankly, not just Africa, but all of our well-being. Because if, if we have stronger health systems there, everybody benefits. And I think that is the that is the hope and, and where we seek to go. Um, and I welcome any challenges to that because I want to learn 
so that we can continue to to change the conversations going forward. Um, so I just want to speak for myself that it is a tremendous honor to be here and to be in this profound partnership desk. I'm looking at you, I'm looking at my colleagues here, but I think, um, but we do have work to do. I'm not going to pretend for two seconds. There aren't many more challenges that have to happen. We are at the end, and I know you had a question, so I'm going to I um, I'm going to ask you to be very brief, and we will we will um, we will answer the question, and I'll ask people to make any concluding remarks as we as we answer. And I want to thank everybody for your time and for the honor of coming a little bit late, so that we can have our colleague ask a final question. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Yoswa Dambisia from the East Central Southern Africa Health Community. Not a question, but uh, what I wanted to comment on has been preempted by uh, partly what James and uh, uh, Professor Maswa and uh, uh, my brother Diallo have already indicated that a lot of what we are grappling with has already been touched upon. The issue is continuity. But uh, whereas I'm not a health economist, I'm, uh, I'm a frontline health worker, and I often put myself in the in, in, in the position of the health minister and realize that that must be the most overworked health worker in the system. Because all the partners, be they uh, local, international, regional, are getting to them with very beautiful, with very beautiful proposals for action, mm -hmm. and this one head is supposed to <laughs> to see how to align whatever is coming in from all these sections. So yes, I think the the major lesson for me is let's let's work together. And for Africa CDC. Please take the message from uh, Professor Maswa very seriously. Uh, we support from uh, uh, HS uh, with other civil society organizations. Exa Health Community uh, has been running a global health diplomacy course. Now, part of the problem, as was documented by Professor Maswa and his team, is the lifespan of our health ministers. I think at the time you did the study, it was about six to nine months. Uh. That's, that's the lifespan of an African health minister. So there is need for continual skilling of, 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 uh, of these leaders of ours because they change so often based on what is happening in the various countries. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, for this conversation, for bringing up some very honest questions and some honest truths. It is our duty to walk out of this room and to then be in service to those questions and, and to this mission. I want to thank our panelists for joining us um, and for being uh, such leaders in this space and for um, contributing. And if I don't know if anyone has any final words, but if not, I... I'm going to wish everyone well into this Tuesday evening and say thank you or morning or afternoon or wherever you are. But thank you so, so much.